Tonight on Panorama, we investigate some of the biggest private companies running our care homes. Oh, my God. There's only one winner, isn't there? And that's the investment companies. Families are asking how care home fees are being spent. They spent £125,000 when you're paying a, a lot of money for his care. I was expecting a little bit more quality. Have some companies been taking too much money out of the system? Typically, they pile a lot of debt on a company at high interest rates, excessive interest rates. Care homes are under pressure like never before. Care and finance don't go together. It shouldn't be for personal gain. It's people's homes, it's people's livelihoods. The government's announced more funding, but is it time for more checks on where the money's going? It is the unacceptable face of capitalism, given that the purpose of the sector is to look after literally the most vulnerable people in our society. As the BBC's social affairs editor, I hear from too many families worried about the care their elderly or disabled relatives receive and the cost of that care. I'm on my way to hear one daughter's experience of her father's care. What was it like growing up around here? Lovely. Everybody knew everybody. Tess grew up in Staffordshire. I've got some beautiful memories there. There was six of us children and my mum had three jobs. My dad was a tyre fitter. Money wasn't brilliant, but my dad always said, pay your bills, save a little, enjoy. Her mum died when she was young, so her dad Mick was at the heart of keeping the family together. My dad had a really good life. Proper, proper gentleman. You know, very quiet and very private. But last year, when he reached his early 80s, Mick started becoming confused. Are they nice, Dad? Nice. I noticed a few changes in him, so I got him assessed at the doctors and he got vascular dementia. Tess found a residential and nursing home in Cannock. Windsor House says it helps residents maintain their independence and individuality. Four days in, five days in, the cracks start to appear. His bed was never made. The toilet area was shocking. My dad's walking in that urine. So my dad shouldn't be walking in that. The local authority paid about £620 a week for mixed care. When the pandemic hit, restrictions on visiting meant Tess saw little of her dad, but she checked on him regularly by phone. I decided to call after five o'clock to see how my dad was. And uh, she said, he's fine, he's pottering around, he's been a little bit sick. I said, he's not end of life, is he? No, no, nothing like that. You've got nothing to worry about. And we'll contact you and have you in. I said, cos I don't want my dad to pass on his own. And then, oh, Four hours later, I got a call to say he died um, on his own, nobody with him. Since Mick's death, the regulator has rated the home as requiring improvement, and there's now new management. The home's run by Four Seasons Healthcare, one of the UK's biggest care home groups. Until recently, it was owned by private equity firms. These are companies that raise funds from private investors. Typically, a private equity house brings together wealthy private individuals and institutions who are looking for a better return than they will get on other sorts of investment. Nick Hood is a business analyst. He says private equity investors typically buy businesses hoping to raise their value by making them more efficient. They take harsh decisions, they improve businesses, they create jobs, they create wealth. There are many examples in other sectors where private equity has been positive and has improved things. It's just in care where it doesn't seem to be working.
John Moulton was an early private equity investor. What is the motivation for people who are involved in private equity finance? Very straightforwardly, people who are involved in private equity finance, as they are in any other form of investment, with a view to making returns. Uh, if you went back to when I started in private equity, anything under 30% was regarded as poor. His team brought together investors to buy Four Seasons in 1999 and sold it to another private equity group five years later, making more than £250 million. Since then, the world's changed. After the financial crash in 2008, government funding was squeezed as part of austerity. Now, it's not so easy to make money. On the whole, they're not making a lot of money. Um, they really aren't. Perhaps they were at one stage, but they really aren't now. So what does this mean for Four Seasons? We asked two experts to dig into their recent accounts. My name is Vivek Katecha. I'm a forensic accountant, particularly focused on the companies that operate in the health and social care sector. Hiya, my name is Christine Paulette Walker. I'm a researcher at the University of Surrey. My research focuses uh, primarily on the financial structures of uh, social care companies. Together, they've drawn a family tree of companies in the Four Seasons Healthcare Group. Now, if you think about Tess's father or somebody similar, they would probably be based in a company around here in the structure. So then these are the ones that run the care homes. But we'd have to go all the way over to the other side of the structure to actually see where that money then flows. So there's quite a lot of companies in between. OK, what I want to do is show you the companies. I'm going to let you unroll it. So just so you know, that's Four Seasons. Four Seasons, yeah. And this is to give you a sense of the company structure and how many companies are involved. Oh, my God. We're at the end of the table now. What's your reaction to seeing it set out like that? I'm gobsmacked, to be honest with you. No, I never knew it was this big a scale. I feel like ripping all this up now. The Four Seasons Group has a complicated structure. In 2019, it was made up of more than 160 companies, including two at the top of the structure based in offshore tax havens in the Cayman Islands and Guernsey. Once it goes offshore to one of these jurisdictions, it provides almost a kind of protective uh, cloak for them. It gives them some sort of anonymity, um, which uh, yeah, means that it's harder to follow where the money is going through their accounts. In the 17 years since John Moulton's firm owned the group, it's been bought and sold three times to different private equity companies, and the structures become more complex. I can barely follow it. It's had so many transactions, bits put into it, bits split out of it. I, can, I really don't even pretend to understand all that's happened. That's quite something to say. You're an expert in this, you invested in Four Seasons, yeah. and yet you can't find your way through the company. No, no, it's not limited to the care home sector. There's plenty of aspects of government and regulation that you can't follow either. The way they're financed is, to a large extent, not very material to somebody going into a care home. That's easy to say from a financier's point of view, but, you know, if, if, if I am putting a relative into a, into a care home, I think I'm entitled to know where the money is going, to know how much of it is going to frontline care. Behind this complexity, there are clues as to where some of the money is going, and the trail leads to extraordinary levels of debt. Each time Four Seasons changed hands, the new owners borrowed money to buy it, and some of that debt sits on Four Seasons books. By 2017, the group owed more than a billion pounds. One of the parts of the Four Seasons story is that they have been struggling now for a while repaying their debts. 2017, the Four Seasons group had about 29,000 pounds of debt per care home bed that they operated, and the interest charge per bed per week was 148 pounds. So, at that time, about 20% of the average weekly fee was going on interest payments. If you take that interest payment off, it is a big chunk of money. 
What do you think about that? I know my dad was funded, but they are taking money out of his pot to pay off their interest. Eventually, the Four Seasons Group was unable to pay the interest on some of its debt. In 2019, two key companies in the group were placed in financial administration. Part of the debt is unlikely to be paid back, but the group still effectively owes £625 million. The care homes continue to operate. This is, you know, obviously going to be of significant concern for those families who have loved ones who live in those care homes because um, it appears to be in a very financially uh, vulnerable and fragile position as a company. Even Four Seasons' original private equity owner is worried. My, my concerns don't lie with private equity. They lie with the levels of debt used in some of these transactions. The instability and concern that that generates is the biggest problem. Four Seasons Healthcare says its ownership structure does not have any bearing on the day-to-day -day care of our residents. It says they and their families can be reassured that the group maintains its focus on the care and well-being of our colleagues and those we care for. Private companies provide more than 80% of care home beds in the UK. Three of the biggest groups, Four Seasons, Care UK and HC1, are or have been owned by private equity firms. They have nearly 39,000 beds between them. Like the whole sector, the majority of private equity bank care homes are rated good or outstanding by the regulator. But also like the rest of the sector, around a fifth are judged inadequate or requiring improvement. It's difficult to take, because my dad worked all his life to what he got. I would try to put him in a home. The one he ended up in was the best of a bad bunch. People like my father, who's done all the right things, and then I feel very angry about it. Dale's father, Norman, spent his working life in Lancashire. His company helped build the country's first motorways. He started work when he was about 15, and he sort of worked till he was about 68. He was a, very much a family man. He had a very strong work ethic. By the summer of 2018, his health was deteriorating. My dad had had a stroke, so he ended up in hospital. He was quite ill with dementia, so he ended up looking for a care home. The family opted for Ashton View near Wigan. It's run by HC1, the biggest care provider in the UK. Right in the middle there, uh, that's the floor that my dad was on. Norman had recently sold his home and had money in the bank, so he had to pay the bill of around £1,000 a week himself. Sometimes he was dressed in clothes that weren't his. I once went in, he had a woman's blouse on. So his dignity had been gone a little bit. It changed. I was just looking at his shell. His room was, we were told that some of the furniture would be renewed. And like six, 12 months later, it was still the same furniture. There was a chair in there that had a big hole in it. I thought a prison cell might look a little bit better than this. And it was just sad. They were also worried about the state their dad was in. I was mortified when I looked at the bottom of his feet because they were as black as tarmac. I got an apology off the curl manager at the time. That, that was like a small snapshot to me of what was going on. It was horrible. Good boy, eh? In October last year, Dale was contacted by Wigan Council. They told him they were investigating allegations of poor care, some involving Norman. The regulator found there'd been problems with staffing and medication and said the home required improvement. A month later, after two falls and a stroke, Norman was admitted to hospital. HC1 wrote to Dale. While he was on his deathbed, 
the communication I got was telling me these curfews were going up. I found it difficult to understand why somebody who'd been in a care home had not got a call from the manager, not a person in that care home. So no one checked, but they sent you the bills? Yeah. Norman died in hospital. He was 91. HC1 says improvements have been made at the home. They've been noted by the regulator and there's a new manager. It apologised to the family and says their experience is not representative of the care we provide across the organisation. How much over time did Norman end up paying for his care? He spent £125,000 when you're paying a, a lot of money for his care. I was expecting a little bit more quality. Dale wants to know if enough of the money HC1 charges in fees goes on care. We asked the company for a breakdown of the £1,196 a self-funder now pays per week at Ashton View. They told us 65% goes on staff, 15% on running costs and maintenance, and nearly 20% on servicing debt, building up investment reserves, and providing a financial return to investors. My dad worked all his life to what, what he got, and all I see in it was just disappearing down, down a, a tunnel. I don't know where it was going, because I, I couldn't see it. Ten thousand miles away in Australia, Jason Ward works for an international tax justice group. He's been taking a closer look at HC1's recent accounts and how it manages its debt. It took many months. It's an incredibly complicated structure. We've pieced together. We've looked at a huge amount of the company filings over a number of years now. What they are doing is not untypical for other private equity-owned care companies. His report's been given exclusively to Panorama. In 2020, the HC1 Group had 81 companies in its corporate structure. The firms near the top are largely based in the Cayman Islands. The whole thing is owned by private equity investors. One of the main firms is led by a Saudi businessman and the other is based in the United States. The HC1 Group also has debts. It borrowed around £300 million in 2017 to buy more care homes rather than rent them. A bank lent most of the money at around 9% interest plus fees. But £80 million was borrowed at 15 to 18% interest from commercial lenders, including one of HC1's private equity owners. HC1 transfers money from its care home operations through a number of different means through offshore related party transactions, mostly via the Cayman Islands, and that includes uh, interest payments on its debt. Within three years, the £80 million debt had grown to £120 million. It's a cost paid to themselves via Cayman Islands structures. And, and, and this is a very common private equity tactic of moving money out of the operating company and to the ultimate investors uh, in a way that maximizes their, their, their profit and limits their liabilities. HC1 says the £80 million loan wasn't used to extract value overseas or deliberately reduce earnings. It says the bank wouldn't lend all the money it needed and that 15% was the market rate available at the time. It says it pays full tax in the UK. And that given our owners are transnational, our top company is registered outside the UK. We still don't know the full picture, and the full picture is not knowable because ultimately the Cayman Islands is, has a zero tax rate and also has very little transparency. It should surely be the case that these structures should be transparent. They should either bring them on shore or else they should 
be required to disclose the full finances of the entire group. It's as simple as that. HC1 says it's a private company delivering an essential public good. It says it consolidated its debt in 2021 with an independent and publicly listed healthcare investor, reduced debt by £66 million and is cutting the number of companies in the group to 37. As the pandemic took hold, HC1, like all other care home providers, was hit hard. And like other companies, HC1 wrote to councils asking for financial help. But two days after the letter was sent, the accounts report a £4.8 million dividend payment. And at the end of the day, they're begging for more money from cash-strapped local authorities. People are cashing in on the value of their homes to fund that care. It's pretty shocking and disturbing. In the months that followed, HC1 received £18.9 million of government pandemic support. It just doesn't sit well with me, ethically or morally, that amount of dividend while your dad eats a cheese butty for his tea. HC1 says no shareholder dividend has been paid since 2017. It says the £4.8 million reported dividend represents £1.7 million in interest on a third-party loan and £3.1 million in asset management fees. It also says, in the past five years, our owners have enabled us to invest £145 million in capital expenditure, far more than all the cumulative dividends and management fees they have received. Jeremy Hunt is a former Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. We showed him the report on HC1. What is your reaction to what it says about the complexity of what lies behind the biggest UK company? Well, I think that report is utterly shocking. Uh, to me, it is the unacceptable face of capitalism because this is a sector that is under enormous pressure. It is wholly inappropriate, given the point of the sector, the purpose of the sector, is to look after literally the most vulnerable people in our society. Is it moral that care homes are an investment vehicle in the way in which they have become? It's very much a judgmental question, that, because morality isn't obvious. Somebody has to pay for that care. Somebody has to run it. Now, in the world we live in, local authorities and central government typically cannot run an efficient nursing home system. The private sector does better. And the profit that it makes from it is a reasonable return in most cases for the effort put in to get that efficiency. Those providing care, including private equity companies, believe the biggest problem facing the care system has been a lack of government funding. It's a time of change for the whole care sector. Even the government admits that it's in crisis. It's announced reforms for England and promised more money for all parts of the UK. An extra £5.4 billion is promised over the next three years, but it hasn't come soon enough to save some providers from financial instability. In Northern Ireland, that's been playing out in the lives of some care home residents and the staff who look after them. Four Seasons, which remains in administration, has sold or returned leases on 15 homes here, including this one in Ballymoney. Nikki worked at the court care home for 16 years. I work as a senior care assistant. I enjoyed working for them. So I did Four Seasons. Um, we have a dementia unit. All aspects of care in our home. In September 2020, staff were told new operators had taken over the lease. We were told that we were being bought over by businessmen. They were going to take us over. Yep, somebody else is coming in. The new owners had their own plan to make the home viable. It didn't involve private equity. Instead, they were offering what was described as an outstanding investment opportunity. 
All I heard was the Infest Rooms, which was where they own our building, they run the care home, and basically they sell each room for a substantial amount of money. They were selling leases on individual rooms to investors for up to £75,000 each, with an assurance of high returns. But now the home stands empty. The regulator in Northern Ireland, concerned about the financial plans and who had responsibility for running the home, ordered its closure. Within two weeks, new homes had to be found for the residents. One of my clients, I was taking her down the lift and she turned around and said to me, um, I don't want to go. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. The carers' families were devastated. Care and finance don't go together. Yes, you need to make money to make the business viable and that, but it shouldn't be for like personal gain. It's people's homes, it's people's livelihoods. It's not just like closing a shop. For many decades, the private sectors played an important role in providing care. But now there are calls for an investigation into whether the market's operating in the best interests of consumers. And for the government to introduce more checks on how care home fees are spent. There's a real opportunity now to lay down a long-term plan for the sector and to channel private sector investment in the way we want. And that could be a very positive thing. At the moment, it's the Wild West out there. And until we give that clarity, I don't think we're going to get the positive type of investment that we really need. The Department of Health and Social Care says it expects local authorities to ensure providers are offering good quality care, improving workforce conditions, and are investing in services. For the families, what matters most is that the money spent delivers good quality care for those who need it when they need it. I would not only invite those people at the top to spend a month as a resident, I would invite them to spend six months as a carer, doing personal care, just so that they can actually see what is actually funding their lifestyle. What do you think they'd make of it? I don't think they'd last 24 hours, to be honest. Looking back at the care, that my dad received. It's quite upsetting. My dad ended up in a room, I'd say, 10 foot by 8 foot with a tatty old bed, wardrobe, set of drawers, with all stuffing from the previous resident. It's heartbreaking, really, because they should be living their best life. This is a topic that affects so many of us, including Ed Balls. He wanted to learn more about the reality of working and living in residential care. Watch his revealing two-part documentary, Inside the Care Crisis, on BBC iPlayer now.